Hi, so I wanted to go ahead and do um, a video of me with Criminal Law. Let's get rid of this little pop-up there. That's better. Um, criminal Law is something I know so many of you are super duper interested in, and I was fortunate fortunate enough to get to practice in for quite a while. I worked for the Private Conflicts Council, which is basically like an alternate alternate public defender so allegedly we have um somebody who can't go to the public defender because they've allegedly committed a crime then they've allegedly committed another crime so they can't go to the alternate public defender and so then they have the private conflicts council which is privately retained attorneys um on behalf of the government for someone for their supposed third or fourth crime um, and the reason I did this was because at the time you had to have 10 years criminal trial experience to be a uh, court appointed attorney for the homeless and the mentally ill. And that was what I really had wanted to do and try to make the world a better place. And about after about five years of doing criminal trials, which don't always have a lot to do with representing the homeless or the mentally ill. Um, I enjoyed those five years, but I just found that, um, in my personal experience, they didn't always catch the alleged criminals because they were super duper smart. Um, I had a client, well, not my client, but I had, um, a co-defendant who actually, for instance, took a, um, ax to a jewelry counter not the smartest move because his jewelry counters are bulletproof glass and so he took this axe whack and it came right back hit him in the forehead and then he's bleeding everywhere and he still decides to try to escape his dna is in the system so they pick him up right away um and so you know i really enjoyed and found it fascinating at first and then for me personally it just got a little bit boring because um Sometimes the criminals were caught because they just weren't the smartest. And so I went ahead and switched to another area of law. And one of the things that I personally find very interesting is I find high level uh, criminal law very interesting, like people that um, maybe try to defraud investors. And yes, this is a horrible thing that they're doing, but it's really interesting to try to outsmart them and um, figure out this giant puzzle, if you will. So just a different perspective, not to tell you that, you know, if you want to do this, that's not for you, just to give you the more personal, personal perspective on it, just so you can kind of get maybe a different viewpoint. And um, don't forget to read your objectives on your own. Okay, so criminal law typically starts with an arrest. Okay, and so the cops are detaining someone to ask questions and they have to show probable cause. So, um, but the subject of probable cause could be a whole entire another like huge class. Um, but I've given you an example, you know, in order for the cops to pull someone over for suspicion of drunk driving, they usually have to have some sort of tip. Maybe a bartender called and said, you know, this person got into their car after drinking too much, or um, maybe they're driving erratically. So typically the cops have to have some sort of probable cause. All right, and I've given you um, a case on, um, you know, probable cause and, you know, it's just really heartbreaking right now. And it's just really upsetting with all this stuff on the news lately about, you know, whether or not cops did have probable cause for different things that they did. And, you know, maybe the law needs to change. I don't know, but you can kind of read this as a really interesting case and make your own decision on whether or not this person had probable cause. And I've let you know down here at the bottom that the court ruled that the officer did not. So it's just a kind of fascinating um, perspective, if you will. All right. 
so after there's an arrest, um, the arrest triggers some constitutional protections. You've probably heard of Miranda rights and you're going to have to look at your regular PowerPoint to get this uh, video to work, but it'll talk about those Miranda warnings. Okay. And the Miranda warnings come from the famous Miranda versus Arizona case. And people think that that's required to be said every single time that there's an arrest, but not really. Um, however, I think if the cops forgot, the alleged criminal or defendant would sue about that because it's just so publicized in the news and it's so publicized in all these um, legal TV shows and movies that people just automatically expect their Miranda rights. Okay, then there's typically um, an information or indictment um, in California. And so the information, like I put up here, is it's filed by the district attorney after a preliminary hearing or there's an indictment brought by a grand jury. And a grand jury is a special type of jury um, to hear some cases. Okay. So an indictment is that document that officially charges the defendant typically with a felony and a felony is pun published blah, blah, punishable by up to a year in jail. And a misdemeanor is different because it's usually, I mean, excuse me, I said that wrong. A felony is over a year in jail and a misdemeanor is up to a year in jail and or a fine. Okay, then there's an arraignment, and this is when the defendant goes to court. He's officially apprised of the charges against him in court, and he's given a copy of that written indictment. Um, there's big-time rules about discovery in criminal law. The prosecution basically has to turn over absolutely everything so the defense can try to defend their client. And then at the same time, the defendant can go ahead and enter a plea. Um, and if they say they're not guilty, then usually that's set for trial. In criminal cases, typically the defendant must have a chance to be heard within a year, right to a speedy trial. Um, sometimes they waive that right and the case goes on after a year, a criminal case, but typically they have the right to be heard within a year. Um, if they do plead guilty at that point, the arraignment, they can go ahead and be sentenced at that particular time. All right, so discovery is when we ask questions, either oral or written, um, and we really find out all the evidence of the case that we're going to need for trial. And I've given you uh, kind of a poor copy, and I've taken out um, the client's confidential information. Um, but this is an actual witness statement disclosure. It was gotten by a private investigator for basically the city attorney's office in San Diego. The city attorney's office handles um, misdemeanors within city limits, and then almost everything else is handled by the district attorney's office. So it's a little bit confusing in San Diego. <clears throat> but typically, the government has private investigators working for them. They don't call them that, but that's essentially what they are. Okay. Um, you can read this one on your own. I do like to test on this in the final. Um, the concept of principles and accessories. Okay, and then you've got the accessory before and after the fact. Hint, hint, nudge, nudge. Okay, and then... Um, just talking about some of the different crimes there are. Murder, what is it? You can read that on your own. Manslaughter is a little bit different. Uh, it usually is an impulse thing um, where it's not premeditated and if convicted, a person typically gets less jail time. And one of the really interesting things to know about criminal law and one of the things that kind of... Um, did was a little bit disappointing and upsetting once I started to practice it was to learn that most convicted murderers spend five years in jail. And then the other thing that was really interesting um, was that most nonviolent offenders 
um, because our jail system is so crowded here in California, they will go in on a Friday and be out on a Monday. So we truly have an overcrowding um, problem in our jails in this country. And, um, you know, I'm not a politician. I'm just speaking from my own personal experience of what I've seen. And it's just, it seems like a lot of it's actually broken and we could do a better job as a society, perhaps. Okay, um, assault and battery, we've talked about before. Larceny, you can read on your own. Same with burglary. Okay, let's talk about the verdicts in a criminal case. And um, the jurors decide the facts of a case, but they also apportion guilt. And um, typically not guilty means we don't think the person did it, or the jurors found a lot of times also that the um, government did not prove that the criminal defendant was guilty beyond a reasonable doubt. And that is a standard of proof in a criminal case is beyond a pre reasonable doubt, which is beyond, uh, you know, almost any doubt, but not quite all doubt. And we talked about that before in more detail in prior um, classes. Okay. And if a defendant is found not guilty, the um, that case cannot be retried, and that's known as double jeopardy. So if defendants found not guilty, and then it's figured out later that they are in fact guilty, they cannot be tried twice for the same crime. So occasionally you do get people that are guilty walking free, and um, sometimes you get people that are innocent. Um, being convicted, which is a shame as well. And my law school is um, the head of the California Innocence Project, and they've actually found um, a few people that have been convicted uh, unjustly and um, used a lot of DNA evidence on old cases to prove that people are not um, guilty. So it's, it's fascinating. Um, you know, I do think we we have um, irregularities in our system here, but it is a lot better than a lot of other country systems. I mean, humans are, you know, we are not perfect, and so we make mistakes, but I do think it's a better system than a lot of countries have where they don't have trials. Um, so it's at least we have the system of having a trial and trying to get it right, even though it's still flawed. Okay, so I have a personal experience um, with a not guilty verdict, and, and I have actually served as a juror, juror three times, even though I'm an attorney, that's kind of unusual, but um, I remember being on this one jury case, and I can speak about this one with you because I don't have a duty of confidentiality, the attorneys um, do, but I don't as a juror for this one. and. Um, we suspected that both defendants were actually, in fact, guilty of uh, selling dimes of crack cocaine, but one, um, one defendant, the government just didn't prove it. So we can't put somebody, or we're not supposed to put somebody in jail unless the government can prove that they are, in fact, guilty beyond a reasonable doubt. All right, um, alternate jur verdicts. Um, sometimes people are found criminally insane, and they might become part of the state psychiatric system. Um, there are state psychiatric hospitals, and I've given you a little bit more information about that. And, you know, I think the um, legal movies and TV shows make it seem like, oh, you know, somebody got off because they said they were insane, and... Um, it's not really that way. I mean, you can see these lovely pictures of what it looks like. It's, it's like a little jail itself. So just something to think about. All right. In criminal, we are supposed to typically have a unanimous verdict in most jurisdictions. And if there's not a unanimous verdict, it's called a hung jury. There's a mistrial. And then in that case, if there's a mistrial, the case can be retried. Okay, sentencing. Um, 
if the defendant is found guilty, the judge will help um, figure out the possible sentence. And these are factors that increase or decrease a potential sentence. They're known as aggravating factors or mitigating factors. And you're going to want to notice one of these for the final, because I believe there's a question on this in the final exam. Okay, I am out of my time, so I will let you read appeals on your own and as well as the case, and don't forget your questions. All right, bye.